Welcome everyone to the first public event of the Climate Mitigation Accelerator at NYU School of Law. My name is Cesar Rodriguez Garavito, and I'm a co-director of the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice at NYU Law, which is the home of the Climate Mitigation Accelerator, or CLX for short. Today we'll be discussing a key issue. Most of the legal actions and lawsuits certainly those based on human rights tools and arguments have been uh, targeting governments as opposed to corporations for climate harms. There is a whole frontier of litigation and legal action that needs to be explored to hold corporations, including fossil fuel uh, companies, accountable for climate harms and extreme weather events from the ongoing fires, uh, the west coast of the US to uh, Typhoon Hainan in the Philippines, which is actually the basis or the underlying story in the key um, case that we will be discussing today with some of the central experts participants in some of the episodes of that case, which is the uh, inquiry by the Filipino Commission on Human Rights against uh, fossil fuel companies that are called the carbon majors. Those have that have been produced a, a considerable amount, of most of the um, fossil fuels throughout history, as Rikini will be able to tell us because he's done the uh, very detailed accounting of those emissions. Before launching into the conversation, let me say a few words about the broader initiatives that this webinar um, uh, are part of. First, uh, on CLX, Climate Litigation Accelerator. The CLX is a space for fostering collaborative and urgent legal action to tackle the climate emergency around the world. What we do is carry out research on complex social legal issues, such as how to deploy climate science and human rights tools to advance climate action. We also workshop cases with partner organizations in different parts of the world through interactive sessions with experts from multiple fields that help refine uh, uh, the ideas for litigation and also learn from cases going on in other parts of the world. We also convene a community of practice of researchers and advocates who first came together here, here at NYU Law uh, back in March and who continue to meet to discuss strategic issues and brainstorm about new cases and legal avenues. We also carry out collaborative legal action and litigation. For instance, uh, an, an ongoing major case, a recent case before the Brazilian Supreme Court that is examining uh, post, uh, the Bolsonaro government's uh, uh, sad record on deforestation and uh, environmental degradation in the Amazon region and its impact on uh, climate change around the world. And finally, we produce publications from blog posts to strategic reports to books. And I'm just gonna show you all because it may be of interest to the audience, uh, one of the first products of this type of uh, work, which is a blog series uh, put together by the community of practice that I mentioned earlier that uh, came together in New York and now is uh, putting together, producing a collaborative uh, volume, an edited volume on litigating the climate emergency. This is uh, a series co-sponsored, co-organized with Open World Rights, a uh, well-known uh, portal for human rights opinion and interaction among practitioners and scholars. And today's feature article is actually on the Brazilian case. Which uh, whose public hearings took place on Monday and Tuesday. So we're talking about very recent interesting developments. And if you click on this article, you will go into the whole series uh, that uh, OGR and CLX have published over the last couple of months. And you will see articles by uh, some of the participants in this round table on various angles, jurisdictions, legal ideas, strategies uh, around climate litigation. So this is an invitation uh, for you all to make use of these tools. Uh, certainly, 
uh, we're interested in um, hearing from uh, litigants and uh, researchers, both from the Global South and the Global North. This really is a, an effort to bring together um, um, interested parties from around the world. So please do reach out to us uh, at uh, CHRDJ, the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice at NYU. With that, I'll say uh, finally, yes, uh, by way of opening the, the session today, that uh, this is part, this webinar is part of a um, broader uh, effort by CHRGJ at NYU to bring together researchers and advocates from around the world working on existential challenges and promising responses to key human rights and global justice issues, from inequalities to the climate emergency to technological disruption and beyond. The roundtables, as you will see in a moment, are meant to be interactive. As, uh, we will have presentations, we will have more of a roundtable, and the uh, roundtables are recorded and made freely available on CHRDJ's website and YouTube channel. Which lead us straight to uh, into today's uh, roundtable. I won't say much by way of introductions to our panelists because they're all uh, well-known uh, researchers and practitioners, and also because uh, they will have a chance to elaborate on their uh, important work and the role in the carbon measures inquiry. Uh, so we'll start with a uh, Hasmina Paudak uh, from Greenpeace uh, Southeast Asia. Then uh, we turn to Rikiri from the Climate Accountability Institute. And finally, uh, to Ben Franta from Stanford University. Uh, again, I will just offer very quick prompts uh, where they're not expected and, uh, to give presentations that we mean for them to, uh, all of us, uh, for them to engage in a dialogue and then for the audience to be able to submit questions um, and for them to engage with some of those questions at the end of the session. Um, so to get us started, we'll show you a great uh, video clip produced by Greenpeace about uh, the carbon measures inquiry. Sound. I think we're not getting the sound. Okay. to Greenpeace for the video. So Greenpeace is part of a, a coalition of organizations and, and, and a group of individuals who, who were directly affected by Typhoon Hainan that filed uh, this request for an inquiry before the uh, Filipino Commission on Human Rights. And has been a project, has been a key actor, leader, activist uh, in this, this struggle. So, uh, Hasmina, 
could you give us a story uh, and comment on the trajectory of this case and importantly where you see this going because we as we speak this is late september 2020 we're expecting the report from the filipino commission to be issued any time now so could you uh, please get us started thank you sister Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone, and for those who are actually from the Philippines a pleasant evening. Um, earlier, you've seen uh, the video briefly telling you of our climate justice story. Two days ago, on September 22, we celebrated the fifth year anniversary of the filing of the Climate Change and Human Rights Petition. Before sharing you the trajectory and the recent developments, to refresh your memory and for the benefit of our new audience who are watching, there were unique uh, strategies employed in our legal action. We complemented it with offline and online campaigning. We launched an online signature campaign for our petition uh, to increase awareness. Um, we also um, uh, did artivism using arts and activism like storytelling, mural painting, film fest, and etc. Through Human Library, we showcased climate-related stories um, of individuals highlighting the struggles and the injustices they suffered. We acknowledge that the limitations on the power of the commission, hence we worked with local government units to have climate justice consciousness, and we were able actually successfully to get at least five resolutions from different cities or municipalities in the main three island groups of the country, supporting our cause and the national inquiry. Also, we acknowledge that community work is equally important to change mindsets and behavior, irrespective of the outcome, though we wanted to have changes on the ground, hence we actively engage with communities while maintaining the legal action. And as shared before, in December 2019, during the COP25 in Madrid, Commissioner Roberto Cadiz, the lead commissioner of the National Inquiry, announced some of the initial findings, specifically highlighting that carbon major companies played a clear role in anthropogenic climate change and its attendant impacts. The carbon majors also have an obligation to respect human rights as set out under the UN guiding principles which are derived from international human rights law and which from uh, form a basis in establishing standards of behavior for businesses in the climate context. Now, here are the recent developments, um, Assessor. Following said preliminary uh, statements, last July 29, 29 of this year, in a public webinar co-organized by the Commission, Commissioner Cadiz made the following pronouncements, but due to limited time, I'll just capture some of them. First, climate change is not only a human rights and an existential issue, but also a justice and business issue. Justice issue because the communities or individuals who contribute less to the happening of climate change are the most impacted, but like the Philippines, it is a business issue, according to the Commission, because big multinational corporations have large contributions to fueling climate change, and they have an obligation to do their part in mitigating the crisis. Second, while international human rights law provides appropriate standards, the Commission concluded that cases can and should be brought in domestic courts under national laws. Where existing laws are not adequate, the commission recommended that governments have an obligation to adopt legislation to ensure access to justice for affected communities. Uh, third, the commission also emphasized that carbon majors have a moral obligation to help lead the transition towards clean energy and willful acts to obstruct or obfuscate becloud climate science and or derail or delay global transition towards clean or renewable energy may be basis or legal grounds for liability, which liability must be established before domestic or local courts and which can be informed by international human rights law. Fourth, also the commission further added that these carbon majors have responsibility to conduct climate change and human rights impacts assessments other than environmental impacts assessments and reveal these not only to regulatory agencies, but also to, go to governments in general. Six, the commission also recommends that states should stop providing incentives and tax breaks to activities that are related to fossil fuel extraction. Instead, incentives should be given to activities or efforts towards renewable or clean energy production and seven states 
according to the Commission, should further promote and enforce the principle of transparency, require corporations to be more transparent in terms of their carbon footprint, like how much they're investing on renewables and on fossil fuels. But you know, even without the resolution or final report that we are waiting anytime soon, hopefully, inshallah, we already see these preliminary findings as a victory because uh, the findings of the commission will hopefully lay a basis for the Philippine government to issue policies declaring climate emergency and or legislations related to climate change using human rights lens. Other governments like the US, for example, can be inspired by this declaration and follow suit. It is also um, a validation or it validated petitioner's position that carbon major companies played a clear role in climate change and its attendant impacts, hence must be held responsible. That's the essence of climate justice. Now, the body of evidence on what fossil fuel companies knew about climate risks and what they did with this knowledge is very compelling and lays the basis for legal claims. But of course, further efforts by researchers and investigative journalists like our experts here, my co-panelists, these are very, very essential and crucial. And community Communities platform to redress their grievances in the context of climate change and human rights has been firmly cemented. This platform is not only through courts, but also through human rights institutions. Finally, but I think more importantly, the National Inquiry has created an authoritative and massive body of scientific data, documentary evidence, and legal analysis for corporate responsibility relative to climate-related human rights harms. The evidence is already up in the Commission's website and also um, by a Greenpeace website, and these are accessible to the public. So this can be consumed by everyone. That's all, Thank uh, Cesar. Thanks so much, Hasmina, for such a thorough and yet succinct uh, summary of a very complex and rich case. Um, and what you said about science and the role of evidence is a perfect segue into the conversation with Rick and Ben because they have been instrumental for helping produce that type of detailed, rigorous evidence. So Rick, do you wanna uh, comment on uh, the problem or the challenge of accounting uh, for and actually counting emissions and how that the science and the accounting of emissions uh, that you have contributed so much to has contributed already to mitigation, including the carbon measures inquiry, but also what you see as the main avenues for the deployment of scientific evidence of this type in future litigation. You're new to it. Thank you, Cesar, and uh, especially to Hasmina and her colleagues at Greenpeace Philippines and to uh, our colleagues at Climate Justice Program, which gave impetus to start this work on carbon majors almost 20 years ago now. I have long held the view that fossil fuel companies hold a special burden and that they have a moral, financial, and legal responsibility for exacerbating the, the climate crisis and thus a commensurate burden to de decarbonize the world economy and to compensate victims. As I mentioned, this project grew from a single company, a study of a single company in 2003 or so to focus on the climate impact of a single oil and gas company and we chose Standard Oil from 1882 to ExxonMobil in 2002. And that was the first project in trying to quantify not only the operational emissions from the supply chain of extracting and refining and delivering fossil fuels, but more importantly, the climate impacts and the carbon content of the fuels that these companies uh, Exxon and Mobil in particular, delivered to world consumers that led to climate change. Why focus on fossil fuel producers? Because historical emissions are what drive climate change. Companies have produced a lion's share of the carbon fuels that cause climate change. They've been aware of the threat of climate change to their business model since the 1960s, as Ben will discuss in a few minutes. They have actively misled consumers, investors, and legislators on the climate risk. 
and they have the technical skills, capital and moral responsibility to reduce net carbon production in line with science-based targets of well below two degrees centigrade as outlined in Paris. So beginning with the project on ExxonMobil, we decided some 12 years ago to expand the database from that single company to as many companies as we could readily get data on and to do an historical analysis of the major fossil fuel and some cement companies. So to date, we have 108 entities in our database from as early as 1854 for a couple of coal companies. 64 of those are investor-owned companies, as you're familiar with, Royal Dutch Shell, BP, Total, ENI, um, Chevron, ExxonMobil, etc. We also have 35 state-owned entities, such as Saudi Aramco, Equinor, Norway, Pemex and Mexico, etc. And nine nation-state co-producers for which we don't have market-oriented data for the corporations that extract it in the former Soviet Union, in China, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, etc. But only for coal. So in all, we have 73 oil companies. 75 natural gas companies and 42 coal producers and five cement companies. So the process is to gather data required to be released to shareholders through the SEC uh, Securities and Exchange Commission Act of 1933 and 1934. So we have an adequate record of all investor owned companies going back to at least the 1930s and often before that. And the process was, in, was not only uh, locally in the United States, but we had colleagues around the world in Johannesburg and Sydney and London and elsewhere to look through libraries for old dusty paper copies of annual reports so that, that we could extract company reported data on how much oil, gas and coal they produced in a year. And we developed a robust and peer reviewed model to estimate how much of the carbon in the fuels that they extracted and sold enters the atmosphere through their consumers who use their fuels after all, as intended by the companies that sold, them, sold the fuels to them. We deduct for non-energy uses of petroleum products, about 8%, so that we can focus on the carbon in the emissions to the atmosphere as opposed to the carbon uh, sequestered in long-lived products such as petrochemicals, plastics, uh, asphalt, lubricants, et cetera. We apply um, peer-reviewed emissions factors and basically quantify emissions for each company, each of the 108 companies going back to as early as the 1850s. And then in sum, our 108 entities have provided almost 70% of all the carbon since 19, so, sorry, since 1751 through their products as well as through their supply chain operational emissions. So that's been the focus of the Carbon Majors project for a number of years. But there are two other important ways to consider the climate impact of companies. And I've begun a, an early investigation of what those other two metrics might be. And in, in, a, uh, in some, we can, in addition to looking at the emissions from what a company extracts and produces and delivers to markets, we can also look at how much fuel they refine in their own refining assets. And we can also look at the emissions from their products sold through the supply chain. So I have some preliminary um, investigation of this issue. And in terms of refined products, the data is, uh, not complete, it's fairly universally reported, but there are data gaps, at least in the records that we have found. Um, but we've managed to gather some uh, data going back to the 1990s and sometimes even a bit earlier for selected companies that we have looked at. And in terms of refinery outputs, they report production of refine refined products of motor gasoline, jet fuel, middle distillates such as diesel fuel, and heavier fuels like fuel oil and home heating oil. So 
my methodology has been to simply gather this company reported data, apply emissions factors to each type of fuel they have refined, quantify it on an annual basis, and sum it for each company. Now, if we look instead at what companies report as having sold through the supply chain, many oil and gas companies, not all by any means, buy not only crude oil products to be refined in their refining assets, but buy petroleum products like gasoline and jet fuel from other oil and gas companies that refine fuel and sell it through the oil company supply chain. And leading oil companies around the world have tens of thousands of petrol stations and thousands of outlets for jet fuel and home heating oil. So typically companies will sell a lot more through the supply chain than they actually extract from the ground or that they refine themselves. And the factor is astounding for some companies. For one company, for example, they, they sell more petroleum products by a factor of 330% from what they actually extract themselves. So this, this is all preliminary work, but I wanted to share one chart with you. Yeah, we could come back to uh, uh, the details in the Q&A, but if you could comment quickly on the slide, uh, we can move yep. on to the discussion. Can you see the slide? I can't tell from yes. myself. Yes, we can. Yes, you can. So, this outlines four companies that I've preliminarily looked at historical data for. This is a snapshot of 2018 that shows the four companies and what they extract in black in terms of their annual emissions in 2018 and the emissions from their refined products in purple and in red, what they sell through a supply chain of petroleum products only. Natural gas is a different issue that uh, is also reported, but that will, that will be um, discussed later on in the, as the research evolves. So I just wanted to open up the discussion in terms of the pros and cons of which metric and ways of looking at corporate responsibility in terms of basing it on what carbon majors has done, what they have extracted. That has always seemed to me like the simplest, less, least complicated way of doing it in terms of not involving uh, a mess of other companies in the supply chain. But there are reasons to suggest that we should look at the refinery output as well as what is sold through the supply chain. So I just wanted to open that discussion. Thank you. That's an incredibly helpful break and goes beyond even the, the evidence and, and the work that was directly used in the carbon measures inquiry. So this is new, exciting emerging work. And with that, uh, let's uh, finish this first round giving Ben a chance to comment on his own views about corporate responsibility and his angle, both on this case and on the broader efforts at holding um, corporations accountable for climate harms. Ben? Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. So my name is Ben Franta and um, I'm a, a PhD student and a law student at Stanford where I study the history of fossil fuel producers and climate science and also climate denial, the history of that. And my contribution uh, to, that, to this inquiry was to provide historical information about what the companies knew about climate change and when and what their response to that knowledge was. And you might have, have heard about this early knowledge and more information is being gathered about how, how much and precisely what the fossil fuel companies knew about climate change over time. Um, the, earliest, the earliest sort of on notice uh, that's known so far is, is from the late 1950s, going all the way back that far, where the heads of the oil industry were put on notice by the famous physicist Edward Teller about the dangers of global warming. And there are other examples too from the 1950s uh, of the oil companies being put on notice about increasing CO2 concentrations from their products and the foreseeable global warming that would result with impacts like sea level rise. Now, by the 1960s, the industry had verified this uh, information internally and they're not, the industry's knowledge of climate change only uh, increased 
from there. And by, by the early 1980s, uh, the oil companies had put together uh, internal task force to monitor climate science, to discuss climate science. And at least some of the companies like Exxon had created very sophisticated and accurate predictions of uh, how much CO2 would be in the atmosphere over time and how much global warming would occur as well. And uh, those have turned out to be extremely accurate uh, uh, down to the part per million, uh, very, very close to what has actually transpired also in terms of how much global warming has occurred. And the companies were predicting specific impacts like sea level rise, like, uh, like climate change induced famine or, or displacement of peoples. So the, the costs were foreseeable. And in fact, actually known by the companies whose products were causing the problem. Now, we're all, I think most of us are also at least a little familiar with the history of denial and deception and delay that was uh, effectuated by the fossil fuel companies and in fact continues to be effectuated today. And by the, by the end of the 1980s, when governments uh, really started to act uh, more boldly on the climate problem, uh, that's when we see the creation of climate denial uh, organized by the fossil fuel uh, companies and other companies that have an interest in fossil fuels being widely available, uh, like automobile manufacturers or petrochemical companies. And that is also an area of historical research, uh, precisely what sorts of misleading communications were put out to the public, uh, who are the funders, who are the, what were the organizations involved, and Today, even though climate denial outright is not as common as it was in the past, uh, the companies still engage in misleading communications by, uh, for example, promoting themselves as being clean energy leaders, uh, by portraying certain products like fossil gas as being sustainable or climate friendly, and so on, other forms of, of greenwashing. Uh, and this is also misleading information that is designed to essentially effectuate delay and the damages in the delay. And that's a, that's a powerful way to think about this problem is that it really has not been a case of information deficit for decades because the companies had a great deal of information, but rather it's been a history of delay. And the longer, the longer delay occurs, the more damage is done uh, all over the world, including to countries like the Philippines. So that whole history is, uh, is part of this case and I think is a central part of, of efforts to hold the fossil fuel producers accountable um, around the world. So I'll leave it at that. And you know, I have other thoughts about the importance of this case, this inquiry, uh, but I think I'll leave it there for now and we can talk about it in the Q&A. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. You guessed exactly where we're going because the questions we've been getting are about lessons uh, from this case and expectations about this case. So in the interest of time, because uh, we want to end around 45 past the hour, uh, part of this is to keep this uh, short and sweet and partly because we also, after this uh, public webinar, the community of practice, um, uh, that convened by uh, CLX will have a strategic conversation precisely around the question of the question that I want to ask on to you all for a very quick round of reactions, so three minutes each. Um, what are your expectations? What do you expect uh, from the uh, Commission's report? And what potential lessons um, could this inquiry offer? to litigants, researchers, activists around the world also uh, pursuing efforts at holding fossil, company, fossil fuel companies accountable for climate harms. Asmina, you wanna take it away? 
Okay, thank you for that question, um, uh, Sister. Um, of course, my, my our expectation as a legal representative for the petitioners is for a full victory that the commission will not um, uh, will really hold these uh, uh, carbon majors um, uh, companies um, accountable for uh, their climate destructive activities. But I think with this preliminary statements that I've shared earlier made by the commission, it is safe to say that uh, we will have that, that the fossil fuel companies have a uh, clear responsibility and business as usual is no longer acceptable. Um, uh, the, the moral and legal responsibilities of the carbon majors uh, like Shell, Chevron Total and um, uh, Exxon are already made clear and thus knowingly continuing the climate destructive operations as mentioned by my colleague here, Rick Kiri, and clouding the climate science and delaying transition to cleaner energy will really make them liable and people will take them to courts. Um, significantly, I think the body of evidence and the commission's findings will be useful for future litigants seeking to hold uh, these fossil fuel companies accountable for the impacts of climate change and force the rapid phase out of coal, oil, and gas. For instance, uh, uh, we have laid out the history of uh, misinformation and denial from um, 1950s uh, to today, which will be um, relevant for other corporate accountability cases, such as the climate cost recovery cases brought by the cities and the states in the United States, and the climate cases against individual companies in Netherlands and other European countries. Further, while the Commission cannot really award damages under the investigatory, recommendatory, and monitoring powers, something that we are, uh, or the petitioners are aware of, the recommendations may actually be used, uh, hopefully, to support lawsuits by communities seeking to hold these uh, fossil fuel companies accountable and to enact tougher regulations and to put pressure on companies to cut their emissions and change um, business practices. This is particularly relevant, for example, in Europe, where a lot of these companies are domiciled as the EU, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is producing legislation in 2021 to make human rights due diligence mandatory for all EU companies. Uh, of course, while we await for the release of the Commission's final report anytime soon, it is um, indubitable that what we've achieved is uh, a victory for Filipinos and everyone who seeks climate justice. Uh, this is not the end, but a, uh, a beginning towards even uh, pursuing greater accountability for these carbon polluting companies. And I hope this community of law practitioners and experts will uh, uh, build on the work that we have all uh, started. Thank you, Cesar. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Hasmina. Perfect. So uh, let's go around the virtual table. Three minutes for Greg and Ben to address the same question, please. Yeah, thank you, Asmina and Ben. Um, ben, you've been looking at this and thinking about the company's historical knowledge and their campaigns to deny the science. And I'm just wondering if, if we can put all oil and gas companies in the same category in terms of what they knew when. Smaller companies may not have research departments or keep their finger on the pulse of climate science and um, climate regulation even in its early days. I'm just wondering if, if it's fair to assume that among the family of oil and gas companies in the United States, for example, being led by the denial campaign as well as by the scientific knowledge developed by Exxon and other major companies, if we can hold the smaller companies accountable to the same degree in terms of what they might have known or should have known. Thanks, Rick. I, I think that it'll depend on each company. Um, there are variations amongst the companies regarding what they knew and uh, the sophistication of their internal uh, research uh, on the issue. At the same time, a lot of these small companies were part of larger trade associations like the American Petroleum Institute. And that means that they either actually knew or should have known the at least the information that the American Petroleum Institute had, as well as the, the general uh, duties of all product manufacturers and product producers of products to be informed at an expert level of the dangers of their own products at any potential dangers. So, so I think that the small companies, this is just, you know, my opinion, but I think that the small companies probably are not off the hook, even though 
Exxon, for example, is um, kind of a poster child for knowing a lot about climate change. Uh, and we know quite a bit about what Exxon knew about climate change. Um, but there's still a lot of information that, we're, that is still coming to light about what companies across the industry knew. So I, it's a great question. And I think only time will tell exactly how a responsibility is allocated in terms of the, the early knowledge that the companies had. Yeah, Thank I think you. you're right that what API knew itself through its smoke and fumes committee and other committees in the 50s and 60s is, is sufficient. And oil companies would have or should have been aware of that. There's also, I suppose, some legal underpinning for having companies be responsible to know what the science is and what the impact is of the products that they sell to worldwide, worldwide consumers. So I'm not a lawyer, but it would be interesting to look into what the obligations are of, of companies to fully understand what the environmental and climate impacts are of their products beyond what the regulators stipulate. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and actually a good way to wrap up because it ties back into what has been said about due diligence and what companies should be doing, should have been doing regardless of the regulations and regardless of, of, uh, of uh, the idiosyncrasies of the legal framework in different countries. Um, with that, we're, we're gonna bring this round table to a close. Of course, we could spend not 45 minutes, but four hours and 50 minutes on, on this case and the various angles. Uh, we've accomplished a lot from uh, hearing firsthand about the uh, legal advocacy strategies and the expectations of a, a coalition of organizations and petitioners who have courageously and very persistently uh, pursued this case for five years now. Uh, and uh, also about the science of uh, accountability and what Rick offered is really a, not only groundbreaking but very rich um, range of possibilities of accounting for the contribution of fossil fuel companies to global warming that really opens up a whole host of legal and scientific questions that I hope this community of practice and litigants around the world will be taking up in their own settings. And then Ben has reminded us that this is not new and that the history of denial and, uh, and neglect may have serious uh, legal consequences, uh, just as it uh, had in other industries, from tobacco to uh, junk food production, pharmaceutical uh, production, and so on. So with that, uh, I'll reiterate uh, our gratefulness to our roundtable participants, to all of you who tuned in. Uh, this uh, recording will be available at, on the CHRDJ's uh, website, and uh, make sure to check out Open Google writes a online series, blog series on litigating the climate emergency. I'm sure that we will be posting blogs in response to the upcoming inquiry uh, or the report in the inquiry by the Filipino Human Rights Commission. Hopefully, Asmina will be a contributor again to that series of uh, blog posts. Uh, so stay tuned and thanks again.